Good morning. It's April 18th here in Seoul, and I'm Peunji. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour, starting with the three-way economic cooperation between Seoul, Washington, and Tokyo. Finance chiefs of South Korea, the U.S., and Japan met in Washington to address recent concerns over sharp declines in the Korean won and Japanese yen. This comes after the $1 exchange rate briefly hit the 1,400 Korean won mark this week, for the first time in more than a year. The IMF has sounded an alarm on South Korea's debt-to-GDP ratio, with a warning that it could reach close to 60% by 2029, after it already surpassed 50% in 2021. It also warned global debt levels could increase as well, with this year being an election year in many countries. A magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake hit the west coast of Japan's Shikoku Island overnight. Seven people were taken to hospital with minor injuries. Top finance officials from South Korea, the United States, and Japan have voiced their deep concerns over the continuing decline of the value of the South Korean won and Japanese yen against the dollar. They committed to ongoing dialogue and cooperation to stabilize the currencies and ensure economic growth. Our Shin Sebyuk starts us off. The finance ministers of South Korea, the United States, and Japan have acknowledged serious concerns regarding the rapid decline in the value of the South Korean won and the Japanese yen against the dollar. Following their first trilateral meeting in Washington on Wednesday, South Korea's finance minister Choi Sang-mok, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and Japan's finance minister Shinichi Suzuki issued a joint statement outlining their commitment to regular consultations on foreign exchange market trends and continued collaboration to promote sustainable economic growth and financial stability. The major concern raised by the three countries focused on the persistent devaluation of the won and yen against the U.S. dollar. The won is currently ranked as the fifth most undervalued currency among OECD countries. According to data released by the Bank for International Settlements on Wednesday, as of February 18th, South Korea's real effective exchange rate stood at 96.7 out of 100, using 2020 as the base year. The rear measures the relative purchasing power of a country's currency compared to other nations. A value above 100 indicates an overvaluation relative to the base year, while below 100 signifies undervaluation. Japan has the lowest index value among the OECD nations at 70.3. This assessment indicates that the strength of the U.S. dollar, coupled with the significant undervaluation of the Japanese currency, directly affects the one. Meanwhile, Bank of Korea Governor Lee chang yong acknowledged slight deviation in the one's exchange rate from market fundamentals, but reaffirmed that the authorities are equipped with the necessary tools to stabilize any volatile moves in the national currency. His comments indicating Korea's readiness to intervene in the market to support the one were made during an International Monetary Fund panel session on Wednesday. He is in the U.S. capital for the annual IMF and World Bank meetings, as well as meetings with G20 finance leaders and leading central bankers. Shin Sebyuk, Arirang News. The International Monetary Fund says South Korea's debt-to-GDP ratio will approach 60% by 2029, having already surpassed 50% in 2021. The analysis comes as the IMF released its fiscal monitor report on Wednesday, where it said global debt levels could increase with 2024 being an election year in many countries around the world. Our Lee Seung-jae has more. The South Korean government's debt-to-gross domestic product ratio already exceeded 50 percent for the first time in 2021 and is expected to reach close to 60 percent by 2029. That's according to the International Monetary Fund's fiscal monitor report released on Wednesday, which included the debt-to-GDP ratio from 2015 to 2029 in 37 advanced countries, including South Korea, the United States, and Japan. The report says South Korea's debt-to-GDP ratio hit 55.2% in 2023, a 1.4 percentage point increase from the year before. 
IMF data also shows that the country's debt to GDP stood at 40.8% in 2015, but surged from 42.1% in 2019 to 48.7% in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. It reached 51.3% in 2021, exceeding the 50% mark for the first time. The UN agency also estimated that South Korea's debt will reach 56.6% this year and will continue to increase, hitting 59.4% in 2029. The IMF also said that global debt levels are at risk of increasing due to 2024 being an election year. Vitter Gaspar, the head of the International Monetary Fund's Fiscal Affairs, said that history and empirical evidence show that governments tend to spend more or tax less in an election year. 88 economies or economic areas representing more than half of the world's population have either held or are due to hold elections this year. The IMF forecasts the U.S. fiscal deficit to remain above 6% over the next five years, with Gaspar noting the U.S. has ample fiscal space due to measures they can impose on the spending and revenue side. However, like the U.S., Gaspar says China's fiscal deficit is projected to rise from more than 7% of GDP last year to around 8% by 2029. This could have consequences for the global economy as China is a major lender to developing countries. The Fiscal Monitor report called for countries to make a renewed push towards improving their fiscal positions, especially due to the tight monetary policies in many central banks which are expected to be loosened later this year. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. U.S. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell has hinted that there will likely be a delay in interest rate cuts due to a lack of progress on reaching the central bank's 2% target for inflation. For more on this, we're joined by Professor Lee Seo Hyun from the KDI School of Public Policy. Welcome to the program. Hi, good morning. Good morning. So the U.S. Fed has signaled that it does not want to lower interest rates because of high inflation, and that it's going to take longer than expected to bring under control. So it seems the rate cut will not be happening in June. When can we expect the Fed to start cutting rates? Could it possibly be even after the election in November? Yeah, um, the market expectation as well as the recently published IMF World Economic Outlook still expects the Fed will lower its policy rate sometime this year. However, the timing of the first cut is uh, now being debated amid the signs of strong recent performance of the U.S. and the pre uh, persistent inflation trend. And currently, the market expects the first move of Federal Reserve will be likely in September, with growing po probability of just one cut this year. And um, also, it is quite plausible that the political calendar will actually influence the timing of, of the rate cuts. Right. And um, how will the delay in rate cuts possibly affect the South Korean economy? Um, yes, uh, we have seen an appreciation in the U.S. dollar in recent days, and if the trend of strong economic performance of the U.S. economy continues, we will see a much slower decline in interest rates. And such delay in the U.S. interest rate cuts would have stronger cooling effects on the domestic economy for South Korea, especially for the consumption and real estate markets, as households could be constrained due to persistently high borrowing costs. And also, the strong dollar is likely to translate it into tighter global financial conditions, which may lead to higher volatility in the general you know, financial markets. And it also puts pressures on inflation with the recent developments in the Middle East uh, geopolitical events. All right, you just talked about this earlier, but um, the South Korean won is falling against the U.S. dollar with the $1 exchange rate briefly surpassing the 1400 mark this week. Um, what's the reason behind this and what can we expect to happen in the coming weeks? 
Yeah, um, as mentioned earlier, the depreciation of Korean won is mainly because of the strong dollar. And the movement of exchange rate to date are largely driven by the interest rate differentials between the U.S. and uh, the other countries, including South Korea. So for some time, the volatility of the exchange rate can be excessive. And in that case, the foreign exchange intervention would be an uh, appropriate uh, policy. And will the escalating conflict in the Middle East have any other impact on the South Korean economy? Uh, basically, geopolitical tensions in the region are likely to adversely impact Korean economy by generating additional supply shocks. Um, and it also can hurt economic recovery with spikes in food, energy and transportation prices. And further geopolitical conflicts could complicate the ongoing disinflation process and delay the Bank of Korea's policy easing with negative effects on economic recovery. All right, and the IMF has kept South Korea's growth outlook for this year and also next year at 2.3 percent, and that's higher than the growth forecast by the OECD or the Bank of Korea. So what's your take on this? Yeah, well, actually, the difference is about one, uh, 0 0.1 percentage point, uh, seemingly uh, insignificant in my view. And what is more important is to understand the revision of the underlying assumptions for the South Korean growth outlook. And the IMF's forecast of the U.S. economy is actually the main, uh, you know, uh, main reason uh, for the upgrade. Um, you know, for the revision and the upgrade, and it is upgraded to 2.7 percentage uh, percent, which is much higher than the January forecast of its uh, own forecast, as well as the OECD and the Bank of Korea. And the difference is about uh, 0.6 percentage point. So uh, basically, this uh, upward revision of the U.S. Uh, economy is uh, because of uh, its uh, recent stronger than expected um, growth uh, and economic performance. All right. Um, thank you, Professor Lee, for your time and insights this morning. Thank you so much for having me. A magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake hit southern Japan on Wednesday night off the west coast of Shikoku Island. According to the Japan Meteorological Agency, the earthquake was initially reported as a magnitude 6.4 earthquake at a depth of 50 kilometers, but was later corrected to magnitude 6.6 .6 with a depth of 39 kilometers. Local broadcaster NHK reported that seven people were injured. No abnormalities have been detected at the Ikata nuclear plant in western Shikoku. Over in the Middle East, by showing the remains of an Iranian of Iranian ballistic missile from its attack over the weekend, Israel once again vows to firmly respond, saying they have offensive capabilities. Our Kim Bogyan reports. While displaying what was left of an intercepted Iranian ballistic missile, the Israeli military reiterated its will that Iran would not get off scot free over its missile and drone attacks over the weekend. The massive missile, one of 120 fired by Iran, was retrieved on Sunday morning in the Dead Sea and shown to reporters at Juliet's military base. Israel Defense Forces spokesman Daniel Hagari emphasized that Israel will decide how and when it will respond. We will respond the way that we will choose at the time that we will choose. We don't just have defensive capabilities who were proven on Saturday night. We have offensive capabilities and we will know what to do and when to do and how to do. This comes amid Tel Aviv's war cabinet having continuous talks about a response to Iran's first ever direct attack. During the latest meeting on Monday, the cabinet reportedly decided to hit back clearly and forcefully, but no other details have been revealed. Though the liberations continue, U.S. officials say Israel's potential retaliation could be restricted in scope against Iranian military forces and Iranian-backed proxies outside of Tehran's territory, given that the international community keeps calling for restraint from Israel. 
Iranian President Abraham Raisi warned Israel as well, saying the smallest action against Iran's interests would be met with a severe, extensive and painful response. Such remarks came during a call with his Qatari counterpart on Monday. Iranian president's words echo those of the deputy foreign minister who told state TV on Monday night that Tehran's response following any Israeli retaliation would come in seconds, not hours. If for any reason the Zionist regime wants to take even minor action against our land, against the Iranian people, against Iran's interests, it will definitely face a decisive and harsh response. And this answer will not take another 12 or 13 days. Zionists should not count in hours, but in seconds. Kim Bo-kyung, Arirang News. The top U.S. envoy to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who visited South Korea this week, told reporters that the U.S. is considering options both inside and outside the U.N. to continue monitoring sanctions evasion activities by North Korea. This follows Russia's veto on the renewal of a U.N. watchdog on the regime. Our Kim jong shik reports. The career diplomat with over 40 years of experience, the top U.S. envoy to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, met with reporters in Seoul on the last day of her visit. This was the veteran diplomat's first visit to South Korea, but her four-day trip, which started on Sunday, was packed with appointments including meeting with the president and visiting the demilitarized zone. The DMZ is one of those places where the past and the present collide, where the lines, literal and metaphorically, that divided the peninsula 70 years ago, not only remained, but unfortunately, I feel more deeply entrenched than ever before. And as I said at the DMZ, that re-entrenchment is owed to the DPRK's lawlessness, both within the country and far beyond it. The U.S. ambassador also said discussions are taking place to continue the work done by the U.N. panel of experts set to expire at the end of this month. That includes charting a path forward following Russia's concerning veto and China's abstention of a U.N. Security Council resolution that would have renewed the mandate of the 1718 Committee panel of experts. The panel has been monitoring, investigating and reporting on sanctions violations by North Korea for the past 14 years. We discussed options both inside and outside the UN system in lockstep with our ROK and Japanese partners because it's critical that all member states continue receiving independent and accurate reporting of the DPRK's ongoing weapons proliferation and sanction evasion activities. When asked about the potential risk of Russia and China opposing such efforts, the U.S. envoy said this. I think we will uh, eventually find a, a mechanism to continue to do that reporting. And yes, Russia and China will continue to try to block those efforts. But that is not going to stop us from uh, finding that path moving forward. The ambassador stressed that the goal of her visit was to enhance trilateral cooperation between South Korea, the U.S. and Japan on the Security Council and beyond. She has left for Japan, where she'll stay until Saturday. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. Good morning, I'm Kim si young and now we turn off to stories from around the world. We begin today in the US, where President Joe Biden on Wednesday called for tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminium to be tripled during a campaign speech to United Steelworkers Labor Union members in Pittsburgh. Biden called on his US Trade Representative Catherine Tai to consider tripling the existing 7.5 average tar tariff rate on Chinese steel and aluminium under Section 301 of the T Trade Expansion Act to 25 percent. The Biden administration has said that China is hindering the American economy by overproducing goods with the government's help and exporting cheaper products to the US. Biden further criticized China, saying that they're not competing, they're cheating, which is causing damage in the U.S. 
Biden also publicly opposed a nearly 15 billion US dollar deal for Japan's Nippon Steel to purchase US Steel last month, which was overwhelmingly approved by the US Steel shareholders last week. Foreign ministers from the Group of Seven countries gathered on the Italian island of Capri on Wednesday to commence three days of talks, which are expected to be overshadowed by discussions on new sanctions against Iran and aid to Ukraine. The meeting was initially scheduled to focus on the bloc's competitiveness amid heightened China-US competition, but the recent tensions in the Middle East called for attention. The U.S. ahead of Secretary of State Antony Blinken's arrival in Capri said that it is planning to impose new sanctions on Iran's missile and drone program. Italy's Foreign Minister Antonio Tajani said on Wednesday that Italy supports the targeted sanctions against Tehran, especially on the makers of drones used in Iran's attack on Israel. Moving over to Canada. Canadian and U.S. authorities arrested six people on Wednesday and are looking for three more in connection to what has been called the largest gold heist in Canada's history. Over 16 million U.S. dollars in gold bars, along with foreign currency and weapons, were stolen from Toronto's Pearson International Airport on April 17th last year in what the police described as an inside job. The suspects forged an airway bill to steal 6,600 gold bars weighing 400 kilograms and around 2 million US dollars in foreign denominated bills, some of which was used to finance the purchase of dozens of firearms. Peel Regional Police released the names of nine suspects who have all been charged with over 19 counts of theft and related crimes. Two men who work for Air Canada's cargo division were allegedly key players in the heist, one of whom has been fired after being charged with theft and the other reportedly having left the airline before the charges were made public. Moving over to New York City now, where a group of ballerinas gathered at the Plaza Hotel in Manhattan to break the Guinness World Record for most dancers on point at the same time for one minute. 353 ballerinas from the U.S. and abroad joined the event organized by the Youth America Grand Prix, the world's largest dance network and ballet scholarship competition. The previous world record was set with 306 ballerinas on point in 2019. On point refers to a technique where ballet dancers stand on the tip of their toes in specially designed shoes. Good morning. A thick blanket of yellow dust continues to cover the Korean Peninsula, with a dust advisory being in place for most parts of Korea and the warning for eastern parts of the country. Air quality is forecast to improve as the day goes on, but southern regions and east of Gangwon-do should continue to see unbearable air quality. Kids and the elderly must wear face masks. I was actually surprised to see many people without face masks on yesterday. Please do so today. And wash your hands frequently. Drink plenty of water for your own safety. Despite the dust, today is expected to be another fine, sunny and warm spring day. Morning temperatures are kicking off around 10 degrees in most parts, but highs will soar fast, topping out a pleasant 25 degrees here in Seoul and Daejeon, Gwangju at 24 degrees. Air quality come back to normal levels tomorrow. Then there's nationwide rain in the forecast this weekend. With that in mind, here's a look at the international weather conditions.
That wraps up today's New Day at Arirang. Thank you for watching. We'll bring you more updates at the same time tomorrow. Hey, Mr. Creepy, who is lying? Make sure you listen to what I say. I may be stupid or quite naive. Good of she's so that in put us back. Step on under, can't I see? Can you? Welcome. Twenty-four hours, the fire is not extinguished. Can you feel it?
끝없이 쏟아지는 포토스파 휴대폰 한 대로 감당할 수 있겠니? 
deep polarization mm -hmm. as to the top tier class in terms of societal income having a lot of more of their students go there mm -hmm. compared to the lower income class so hopefully we'll see less of a gap between these two classes now switching gears to our main discussion topic of the day now another main concern that seems to be a never-ending task for our generation is securing a house or an apartment complex in South Korea reported a few times on how hard this is given that Seoul is one of the most expensive cities in the world when it comes to housing nevertheless being able to have a roof over your head is a key basic human right so here in the studio have you two succeeded in securing your own house in Seoul I, that's, I don't know if I have succeeded, but I've definitely succeeded in having a roof over my head. Um, I have been a renter since graduating from college and having lived in the highest metropolitan cities in New York and here in Seoul City, I've always had trouble finding an affordable housing. Um, even when I was living with my parents, they highlighted the importance of paying rent. Mm -hmm. So I kind of got used to the idea of paying rent. Now, one thing was when I was starting off as a young career woman, it was impossible, impossible for me to do any sort of tonse, the full deposit mm. because when you're just starting out you just don't have that much saving right. so what you end up doing is either putting up high rental you know prices mm. to live in a safer neighborhood because as a single young female I would rather pay a little bit more and have better access to mm. transportation or security exactly mm. now what about you Ji? well I've been living alone most mm. of my during my 20s and my early 30s as well and just like Cheska I'm living as a renter mm. myself here in Seoul mm. but what's a little burdening is that the monthly rent that I use to pay back in graduate school and I was living in the Gangbuk area, mm. northern part of Seoul. Uh, it was a lot cheaper mm. compared to where I'm living right now in Gangnam, but it can't give up on the transportation, yeah. how close it is mm. to Arirang right. and my other workplaces. So uh, I can't say I've successfully <laughs> secured a house for myself, yeah. but I do have a roof on top of my head, <laughs> exactly. just like Jessica said, and I have a place to live in. But I have right to now. admit, I think you guys are relatively on the lucky skill when it comes to our generation because living in Seoul is such an attractive option but it's not that affordable so how exactly how many Millennials and Gen Z are mm. able to afford housing whether that be in Seoul or other regions right. nowadays right so if you take a look at the proportions according to Statistics Korea there are approximately 16 million MZ households here in the country and among them parental cohabitation households or those living with their parents make up the largest share accounted for 42 percent of the total which is totally understandable given the high uh, living costs and housing costs. And the next largest group is couples with children accounted for 19%. This followed by uh, single person households at 15% and married couple households as well. Now interestingly, the proportion of single person households has increased in recent years. Mm. This is mainly due to a rise in unmarried individuals, mm. of course, and those who are choosing to get married later in life. Exactly. I I am one of the 42% <laughs> living with my right. parents. I mean, I would love to be independent here in Seoul, but it's just very costly mm -hmm. with the salary that I get and the spending that I use. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to afford a house, whether that be monthly rent or even chunse. Now, yeah. Cheska, would you like to add on as to how many young Koreans are able to afford their own place mm -hmm. these days? And exactly like you mentioned, and Tihi and I gave our testimonials, it is incredibly difficult mm -hmm. to find a housing in Seoul City. So let's take a look at the screen to see how MZers here in Korea are actually living so more than half of the MZs are actually doing rental and then closely followed by Jeonse which is a full deposit that you put in and then you get it all back after your lease and then about a little over 10% did own their their house and I think one of the reasons that we're seeing such high proportion of renters as we mentioned mm. has to do one with the fact that your first salary or your first when you're first starting off you wouldn't be able to sustain the living conditions of having to pay a full deposit Deposit. But I think the other reason is, as we have discussed here in News Gen, mm. there has been a recent Chonsei fraud that swept mm. the nation. So I think now a lot of a lot of youngsters are turning to rental options, which obviously is a lot safer. Mm. Mm. Exactly. And we've mentioned a few times on News Gen that Chonsei fraud has actually pushed a lot of millennials and sometimes even Gen Z to go to the brinks of thinking of taking their own lives. Mm -hmm. This is a yep. very severe problem here in Korea. And understanding that it's hard to change the reality of the circumstances circumstances we're living in, many young adults in the country have come up with creative ways to better find housing. And one of that way is 
co-living. That's right. So, Chi, why don't you first introduce mm. what co-living is and how popular it is mm. among the younger generation? Sure. So, co-living is really a new trend that's been gaining popularity, especially among professional uh, workers. And this is mainly due to rental scams, like we mentioned, the chance frauds that we've been facing, uh, which has made people more cautious about renting apartments on their own. So, co-living is a type of accommodation where you have your individual bedroom and and a bathroom, but common spaces such as the kitchen and the living room are shared among the residents. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so for example, they have, uh, they're kind of like an upgraded version of boarding houses mm -hmm. as well as koshi ones that mm -hmm. we commonly see here in the country. Mm -hmm. So it's like a dormitory style um, room, but then it's a little, uh, a lot more uh, expensive mm -hmm, compared yeah. to these koshiwans and the boarding uh, houses. And what's different is that these co-living uh, spaces are often run by companies mm. and there we're seeing an increase in number of these types of accommodations, especially in the most busiest urban areas mm. within Seoul, such as Gangnam and Myeongdong. Mm, and Jihee, being a Seoul light for so mm. many years now, have That's you right. ever experienced living in a co-living habitat? <laughs> I have actually. I've been living in one of these co-living habitats or accommodations in Pangyo, which is known as the Silicon Valley of ah. Korea. Uh, it's located south of Seoul. And I've been living there for a year actually last year. And in fact, it wasn't just the kitchen and the living room or the lounge mm. that was shared. Mm. They also had an exercising room, a mini, mini theater you could book. Oh, that's so nice. A working room <laughs> and a printing room, a meeting room, and even a laundry room. And they even had uh, a very hotel-like um, terrace, where a terrace mm. with a uh, sunbed as well—not oh. a sunbed, but sunbeds. Wow. Oh. And, and they were very pet-friendly as well because they have <laughs> designated zones where you <laughs> could walk your pets. This sounds like a great idea mm. because if you pay just the right amount, you're mm. still though you have to live with right. people that you may not know. You can get close exactly. to them mm. while enjoying all those mm. different type of services out there. Especially, it's really nice as a pet owner to hear that there's mm. also exactly. pet friendly options. Mm -hmm. she, uh, Cheska, would you like to add on? I like how it's like a designated pet friendly exactly. area, like this section yeah. is squared off with those with pets. Mm. But as Jihee mentioned, a lot of corporations are jumping into the co-living spaces, so much so that the government has actually decided to sponsor and make some legal um, types that if the corporation decide to build more of these co-living spaces, you can actually get even loans from the government. But one other thing that I would like to add about co-living is, although I have not had the opportunity to live like Jihee mm. did, I have visited a a couple of my starter friends who actually do choose to live mm. in this co-living and one of the reasons and that they gave me was even though the living quarter itself is a lot smaller than having your normal rent the common rooms serve a greater purpose mm. for instance as she as she, she mentioned mm -hmm. they do a lot of cookout and even some places they have a, they have even have social events related to career right. so they have a co-living space specifically designated for software developers mm. or artists and mm. you get to not only mingle with the people that you live with but also network yeah. and build this kind of relationship which i thought was quite creative mm. and i do think that that this type of trend was facilitated by our generation, but we have to admit that the government is always aware about all the different housing mm -hmm. crisis situations out there, whether it be tonsef fraud or trying to make mm -hmm. houses more affordable by lending a lot of people with uh, more affordable mm -hmm. options or chungyak. Now, is the government supporting latest policies, mm -hmm. particularly in regards to cohabiting or any other affordable housing options for our generation? Well, yes, there are several programs available by the government, uh, such as the Happy Housing, which offers affordable housing options for newlyweds as well as university students aged between 19 and 39. And these options are located close to their workplaces and are offered at prices lower than the surrounding market rates. Mm -hmm. And another program called Youth Purchase Rental Housing purchases existing houses and then rents them out at a subsidized rate to stabilize the living conditions of low-income individuals in urban areas as well. And they also have the Youth Chonsei Rental System system mm. uh, where Chonsei contractors ha contracted housings are re-rented to mm. uh, the younger people at a lower price for them to be a lot more affordable. Mm -hmm. Chesco, mm. would you like to add on to that list? Sure, and here in, in NewsGen we talked about several um, government support systems to youth 
and definitely rental support system is one of them. But another thing is if you are moving frequently, the government also sponsors youth who are on the move. Mm -hmm. And another thing that was interesting was these, con these um, sponsorship comes with certain conditions, such as whether you own a house or if you meet a certain living standard. Mm -hmm. So if you do fall onto this criteria, you should definitely check it out. And as one of the youth living in the city, I do hope to see more of these programs available to sort of different types of income as well. Yeah, I think that would definitely help a lot. Hopefully we'll see that. And it's great to hear that the government is on board with the fact that they are aware about the housing crisis among the youth here. Now, we asked our viewers to share their own unique or special youth housing support programs and policies in their respective countries. If you take a look at the screen, you can find out what three of them had to share with us. Let's start with Slav. Slav says in the USA, it's mostly public housing, subsidized housing, which takes 30 percent of your income for rent, subsidized by HUD, housing and urban development. Leon said Singapore's national pension scheme, CPF, allows members to utilize their savings for various housing purposes. These grants can be used for down payments or to offset the mortgage loan when buying public housing. There's also priority for married couples and young adults who are getting married that can apply for heavily subsidized public flats. Benny said, for me, since the Philippines has some programs that will give assistance to provide housing, they'll depend on the certain loans that the younger generation wants. And despite being well known for its relative wealth, the Netherlands is suffering a surprising housing crisis th these days. The government has stimulated home ownership and left building to the market where many have been priced out and cannot find an affordable house to buy or rent. And this has driven people to present a petition calling for affordable housing. That's why we're going to hear from a Gen Z living in the Netherlands to find out about the housing situation there and if there's any policies we in South Korea can blueprint off of. Let's now turn to Yellow Clip, a Gen Z living in the Netherlands. Welcome, Yellow. Hi, thank you so much for having me. All right, Yellow, we've decided to connect to you because here in South Korea, we've been ha having a housing crisis for quite a long time now. And I was quite surprised to hear that even in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. the situation is similar. Up to last year, I'm well aware that many signed petitions demanding the housing minister to come up with better support and subsidy programs. Why don't you walk us through the current situation there? Uh, yeah, so currently the, the biggest struggle the Netherlands is facing with is overpopulation, kind of similar to uh, South Korea, I would say. Um, yeah, you see a lot here um, that people are struggling to find a house because the demand is just so high. And because of the high demand, also the houses, the house prices will increase. Uh, actually, last week there was an article published that in the top 10 uh, most expensive cities in Europe. Uh, Netherlands is, has four cities in that top 10. So that kind of oh. shows on uh, how expensive it is here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, through petitions, people are trying to uh, find their voice to, uh, to get some things changed. Mm. Well, I see then where do most millennials and Gen Z in the Netherlands live at the moment? I mean, what type of housing contracts mm. do they usually go for? Um, yeah, at the moment it's it's mostly renting. Uh, mm -hmm. Buying your house is, is very hard, um, especially with starting salaries. Uh, I myself am a student. I live in a I think most typical uh, student house you can <laughs> uh, you can imagine. It's the um, most thing we have here is living in rooms. Uh, it's not like South Korea where it's uh, most students live in dorms. Uh, usually it's led over by the market itself. Uh, we do have dorms, but that's mostly for international students. Um, but for myself, like I live here with three other people, it's 16 square meters. We share uh, a bathroom and the kitchen, and that's, I think, the most standard uh, you can get here. Uh, but after your student life, when you want to get something on your own, uh, you're still kind of stuck to renting since, mm -hmm. yeah, getting a mortgage with a starting salary would only give you about half the amount of money that would suffice to buy an average house. Um, so you either start already with a lot of money to buy a house or you're going to have to rent for a while. You know, you explained perfectly some of the things that our generation goes through when we first have to go out and find housing. So are there some youth support policies in Netherlands as well? And if not, are you looking forward to some measures and support that might come into place in the future? 
Um, yeah, there are a couple um, measures already being taken. Uh, one of them, for example, we have a housing subsidy um, if you're older than 23, so that's that's pretty much in the red uh, age range. Um, you have to uh, not earn too much. The house has not to be of too high quality, uh, but based on that, you can well convert it to one about 500,000 won uh, per month uh, for subsidy for your house. So that's that uh, helps a lot. And I think for the the problem the government is struggling with most with. Um, is that they do realize, I think, that the housing problem is there and they try to tackle it by building more houses, which seems like a fair point. Mm. But the houses that are being built are a bit too high quality, mm. I think. Um, by being high quality, they also become more expensive. Mm. And that doesn't really help out Gen Z to um, buy those houses because they're not even eligible mm -hmm. or even uh, can't even afford to buy that house in the first place. Mm. Um, so for them, the market doesn't really change. And for now, the new houses that are being built um, are just, are well, being built in a, in a large amount, but just not the right houses, I think. So I think to, right. to, to get that change, they sh should be more affordable. That's a very interesting point because here in Korea too, amongst my friends, we always say there's so many apartments out there, but none of them <laughs> seem to be affordable to mm. me. And that also comes with yeah. South Korea having such a low birth rate. But mm. it's quite interesting to hear that in the Netherlands too, though the government is trying to push out more demand and more supply, it's not really mm. better accommodating to the demand. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much, Ella. It was a pleasure talking to you to, to you today. Thank you. Thank great. You. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. And Yella mentioned a lot of great points. Mm -hmm. He really nailed it in the sense that we're seeing the housing crisis not only here in South Korea, but in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it shed light as to what different governments have to do to better understand what youth need and require. So why don't we come up with our own solutions and voice out what we need in terms <laughs> of living in one of the most expensive cities in the world right now? Sure. So I think just like Yella said, mm -hmm. um, we have to face this. I mean, tackle this in a multifaceted manner yeah. and really to address it um, uh, for the younger generation, especially here in the country, we need to adopt, like I said, uh, we have to approach it from various aspects. Mm. And the most important would be, like Yella mentioned, uh, affordability as well as the supply shortages mm. and also uh, access to financing as well. And I believe that the three most crucial factors, including these, are to to uh, increase the supply of housing, especially in urban areas where there's high demand, mm. and regulate speculation, which often drives up the prices, and improve access to financing by making it easier for young people to obtain mortgage loans with low interest rates. And just like Yella said, uh, increase the supply, but make sure that they're affordable and not too exactly. high quality. <laughs> affordable supply, because yes. at the end of the day, all we need is a roof over our head. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Cheska? I really agree with Shihi in terms mm. of like the importance of being able to finance mm. so definitely more I guess more structured finance for youth who might not have the enough you know credibility or security to back mm. it up but another thing that I would also like to mention is probably priority housing mm. for certain areas or certain people because as I mentioned before when you don't have enough to afford you're more likely to choose an options that are affordable but not safe mm. and that can kickstart a lot of other social security problems mm. in the long run and another thing that I think might be interesting is actually increasing public transportation and making them more affordable mm -hmm. frequent and maybe even including bike lanes exactly. and there actually have been studies where increase in public transportations or you know um, transportation in general actually can alleviate the density of certain areas and right. disperse it because now you're able to live let's say half an hour away from your job but still be able to bike and get there in 15 minutes exactly mm -hmm. and we're seeing a lot of that we're seeing high rail high-speed railways come mm -hmm. about yeah. and also with more remote working I think the pressure to have Having, live it, having to live near the capital it's has definitely been mm -hmm. alleviated, but hopefully we'll see more of a societal and infrastructure change in order for the housing crisis to be stymied. Now, in the meantime, we'll be here every day from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Korea time, bringing you more topics young people are talking about. Special thanks to Chiji. Thank you. And Cheska Daina. Pleasure's always fun. Thank you. All right. And thank you everyone for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. We are News Generation. Welcome.